heard a lot of great ideas from uh, many great innovators, but most of them deal with this world, the Earth that we're in. Uh, we haven't yet gone into the next realm, uh, unless there's a Tinder for space. And, and uh, Gwen, Sh Gwen Sh Shotwell, excuse me, Gwen Shotwell is president of SpaceX. She builds rockets. She has a $1.6 billion contract with NASA to deliver supplies to the International Space Station. And she's here to tell Mary Louise what's next on her to-do list. Mary Louise Kelly and Gwen Shotwell. Um, so that's actually a really intimidating intro to follow. I don't know if you could hear back there, but talking about you build rockets, you have a $1.6 billion contract with NASA to supply the International Space Station. Um, for those of us who, you know, my major appointment for the rest of the night is like getting to the grocery store to figure out something for dinner. This is, this is um, a hard thing to follow. Do you, have, um, do you have a robot who does those sort of chores for you? <laughs> no, but I actually figure out what we have to get for dinner as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> there you go. Well, so I was hoping that you would have some secret to share with all of us that, uh, that provides some, some insight. Um, one thing that your company, SpaceX, cannot be accused of is thinking small. It is your ambition to put people on Mars. What's the timeline on that? Uh, well, we're working on the vehicles, kind of the architecture for the vehicles right now. Uh, we should have some big engines on stands in the next couple of years, and hopefully we'll land some folks in you know, 13, 15 years. 13, 15 years. Yeah. Are we talking ordinary people, astronauts? Explorers, but more ordinary than current astronauts, for sure. Lots of engineers. Engineers with an interest in space, but maybe who didn't train to be an astronaut. That's where we're Well, you know, once you land on Mars, space isn't that important. Now you've got a planet. You've got, a, um, you've got to make it livable. Um, one of the funniest things I've ever heard Elon say was that Mars was a fixer-upper planet. Um, there's a lot of work to do. There's no atmosphere. Uh, you're going to have to mine the water. Elon, who you work with yeah, at SpaceX. Yeah, well, work for. Yeah. Let's be work clear. Work for SpaceX. Yeah. <laughs> um, how long does it take to get there? It depends on the trajectory that you fly, kind of the road that you take. Uh, but uh, I think the fastest path so far with satellites has been about eight months. Eight months. And what are the challenges when you say 13, 15 years? What has to be solved to make this possible that we don't know how to do now? Uh, don't know how to do now. OK, so we have to create an atmosphere. I don't know. I'm, not, I'm a mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to build atmospheres, but uh, I'm willing to look into it. Um, so we, we have to build atmosphere. We have to figure out how to protect humans from radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the atmosphere. once we get there. On the way there. On the Actually, way there. on the way there. OK. Yeah, the atmosphere is a kind of a comfy cushion around Earth that protects us from uh, much of the radiation. You know, and we still get sunburn. Um, so when you don't have that protective layer, you're more exposed. So we've got to figure that piece out. What do you do for eight months in the spaceship? You know, you're going to have to figure out how to keep people entertained and, you know, not go cuckoo. Um, so there's that. And then you have to build the giant rockets, bigger than we've ever built before. And that's something your company is engaged with That's right correct, now, yes. Building the rocket. Yes. Is there some fundamental hurdle, you know, that things can get to a certain size and then we have to figure out? Is, I mean, is fuel the issue? Is it being able to withstand certain temperatures? What is it? Physical size is going to be uh, difficult. Uh, as a matter of fact, this, the vehicle that we build uh, for our Mars rocket, the Mars Colonial Transporter, um, we're going to have to build that rocket at the launch site because it will be too big to go over roads, uh, too big for rail. So you actually build the, the tanks uh, at the launch site. So physical size is going to be hard. Uh, propellants, we currently use uh, liquid oxygen and uh, RP, rocket propellant which is a more refined version of Jet A. And to power something for eight months, and then presumably to turn around at some point and get these people back home, you must be looking at some sort of renewable fuel. So we're looking at solar electric propulsion. I think we're going to um, look at some other interesting propulsion, in-space propulsion technologies. But our, our liftoff, both from the surface of Mars as well as Earth, will probably be uh, uh, liquid oxygen and methane. As you see it, what is the point? Why send people through space for eight months to Mars? So I, I get asked that question a lot, especially like angry people. And I'm not saying you're angry. <laughs> not angry. 
yeah. angry people, why are we spending money? I was like, well, you're not spending any money because so far we're paying for it. Um, so there, there's a couple answers. The philosophical, that it seems really a shame that the human species, that humans, were, that we're done, that Earth is it. And I'm not saying that there aren't things to explore and learn here. I think we can learn much more about our physical selves, our mental selves. We can learn more about um, life in the oceans. Um, but it seems like you've got to find a new boundary to go take over and, and pass, pass through. So there's that piece, kind of the philosophical. Humans are, we're differentiated because we want to explore and learn new things. Um, and the other thing is fundamental, it's risk management. Something will happen on Earth to cause a calamity. Now, is it in two years? Probably not. Is it in 100 years? Maybe not. But certainly within the next millenniums, uh, something will happen. And I think it's really important for humans to have an alternative you're talking about a now, plan B. Now, that's the B. crazy talk, by the way. That's, yeah. when, pe that's when you yeah. lose people at the restaurant. Right. They're not paying attention. And they're like, ooh, don't give her another Chardonnay. <laughs> She's done. <laughs> it is kind of a step up from what many of us do, which is have an emergency supply kit in the basement. You're talking about relocating the human race to right. Mars in the case of, yep. in the case of apocalypse. Um, would you go? I would go, but I wouldn't be the first. I wouldn't be the first. Um, <laughs> I don't like to camp. I'm not a camper. And it would be like camping. Extreme camping. Extreme, yeah, extreme camping. I'm the mommy that takes the bucket. Well, first of all, I only go camping where there are potties, and my husband makes fun of me for that. Um, but I take the bucket and the bleach spray, and I clean all the potties so that when my kids use them, they're safe. Right. <laughs> It's, it's funny, I mean, we've been talking all day long. One of the, the themes undergirding this whole day has been how, how technology is changing people's lives. And there have been a lot of practical examples of that. What you're doing is so big. I mean, literally not of this world. How do you, I mean, putting aside for a question whether we're facing an apocalypse in two years or 100 years or 1,000 years, how does what you do impact daily lives of, say, people in this room? Should it? Well, I think, I think people are really generally kind of psychologically very interested in space. You know, you look up at the sky, um, and hopefully you see stars. I live in LA, and you see five. Uh, when I go to my ranch in Texas, you see the Milky Way. It's really extraordinary. And you're like, what is up there? It's very, uh, it really draws your curiosity. And so I think people fundamentally have an interest in space. Um, and so hopefully when they see kind of the enthusiasm and the, the activity, the dramatic increase in activity in space, they start to wonder more and think more about what life would be like elsewhere. And, and I think that also helps you look internally and say, well, yeah, I do want to go to another location, but, you know, how can, how can we fix life here too? Okay. So Mars, what, what other great challenges are on your horizon? What else is in the hopper? So that's a big one. Okay. Um, that's a yeah, lot. That's a, big one. that's a lot. Um, small, smaller ones, although not necessarily less difficult. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, when rockets are used, when you fly a mission, you throw the stages away, and um, you can imagine if we're in the space transportation business and we want to facilitate human space transportation, you can imagine how expensive it is if you throw your gear away. Um, think about flying from LA to New York on an aircraft and they toss it when you're done. Um, it's a really expensive trip and most people wouldn't go do it. Uh, so one of the most important things that we're doing, and frankly this will enable us to uh, get to Mars and back. It's the back part that's really hard. Uh, the going part is hard too, but you have to be able to reuse the rocket. If you can't reuse it when you land there, you can't leave the planet until you've evolved a capability to build rockets from scratch on Mars. Which sounds really hard, actually. Yeah, that that could take a little while. <laughs> so uh -huh. you got to land it, let the people off. The people that want to come back get to come back on. So it's you only have to pay one way. The back home trip is free because <laughs> we got to get it back, the rocket back, so that we can send people again. But this is interesting. This whole question of reusability, because I mean, the, as you say, the traditional model has been. NASA sends a rocket up, and if it makes it back, it burns up on reentry. I, mean, right. I have not bought into the whole um, reduce, reuse, recycle model that we all 
drill into our children. What, what are the engineering challenges involved with that? How do you do it? So in order to get to space, you're, it's speed, right? And it, things are going very fast. And what you have to do is slow it down enough so that when it does reenter uh, the Earth's atmosphere, it doesn't burn up. So thermal protection materials are mm -hmm. important. Um, but what we're really trying to do, which hasn't been done, is to use basically the rocket engines that you have on the vehicle uh, and slow the vehicle down. And we've had two, so we've flown satellite missions, um, and twice we've landed the first stage back in the water at near zero velocity, which is the first time that's ever been done. Um, now, they didn't survive after uh, they were in the water. Um, but uh, so what we're doing on our next flight, I don't know if you've seen the tweets, but uh, we built a, a landing platform um, out of uh, a large sea vessel. Uh, that's kind of self-propelled and it's going to hold its position while the first stage goes and sets off the second stage, delivers Dragon to orbit. We're going to the station later this month. And then the first stage is going to return and hopefully land like a helicopter on this ocean platform. Wow. Yeah. How big are we talking? How big is this platform? Well, it's bigger than a football field, but when you put the rocket on it with its legs deployed, it, it looks small. I'm, I'm worried. Like, we have to land right in the middle. So it's a 170 feet, I think it's 170 feet long. No, 170 feet wide and, and, and maybe 300 or 350 feet long. It makes landing a fighter jet on an aircraft carrier look like child's play by comparison. How about, I mean, just in terms of supporting the impact of that? It's, it should be land at near zero velocity, just like a helicopter. Ah. Yep. That's so what we've done breaking, twice, but in the water the in a not known a priori location. This one we obviously have to know. I mean, the, the, the platform can move a bit, but not that fast. So if we're way off, the rocket will be over here and the landing platform will be, hey, you missed me. Where is this platform going to be? Is there an ideal location in terms of climate and currents? And I think it's a couple hundred kilometers southeast of the launch site. Um, so I believe we are going to, uh, you know, do the ascent of the first stage. After second stage uh, leaves, then we're going to do some retro maneuvers, try to get closer back to Cape Canaveral. Um, we won't, eventually we want to land on land because the, the floating landing platform is yet another challenge. So wow. eventually we'd like to fly the stage back actually and land um, on land at the Cape. You must be like the perfect audience for sci-fi movies. Do you sit and watch, say, the trailer for the new Star Wars movie and think, I want that, and, and go back to your building team and, and kind of, I mean, how much thinking outside the box do you get to do? It sounds like a lot. So I'm a huge Battlestar Galactica fan and Firefly, okay. my okay. two favorite shows. Star Wars was OK, but it's, um, it came about when I was a teenage girl. I was 13, I think, when it came out originally, and, and it, it didn't capture my attention like the new, by the way, it's the new Battlestar Galactica, not the old one, the new one. I think I've seen the whole series twice. I binge watch it. And Firefly, I've seen a couple times, the whole thing. It's awesome. Yeah, I want a spaceship. There that would be go. so great. Who doesn't want a spaceship? Who doesn't want a spaceship? And I want to go beyond the solar system. I think humans leaving the galaxy would be very difficult. I mean, leaving the solar system is possible, right? not very possible right now. Um, but I want to, I mean, I honestly think that there's, I don't want to call them human, but I don't think we're the only ones uh, in, the, uh, in the entire galaxy or, or the universe. So it'd be so cool to meet, you know, I like speaking French when I meet a French person. Can you imagine speaking something else from someone else from but another galaxy? But realistically, in your lifetime, do you think you're going to make it up? No. No. Not to another, not outside the solar system. But outside our planet? You're going to be in space? Uh, possible. I mean, possible. the technology will be there, for yeah. sure. Okay. Let's open it up to questions. I scared you. Hey, uh, Pete Lydon with reInventors. Um, I'm just building off that science fiction uh, question. Now, the relationship of science fiction to big swing engineering projects. Uh, Neil Stevenson, one of the great science fiction writers today has been bemoaning how so much of current sci-fi has been very dystopian, but and he's trying to reshift the culture back to, to really the aspirational science fiction of really swinging for the big swing like it did back in the, in the early days of the 20th century. And I'm just curious, the people you work with, how many of them have been inspired by science fiction and how, much, how, how connected are those two fields and what is the relationship in any way? I think most, and I think there's Star Trek, <clears throat> 
was by far the biggest impact on, on people like me, our lives. Now, I was actually not a Trekkie. Um, I didn't start, I didn't care about science fiction actually till, till my kids actually started mm. caring. Um, I mean, I saw Star Wars, but I didn't feel that connected to it. But uh, yeah, I think everybody at SpaceX has seen Star Trek. Uh, they all love Firefly. Every time I chat with my interns, you know, I get a standing ovation when I talk about Firefly. Who's seen Firefly? It's totally worth binge watching on a weekend, by the way. It's a great show. There's not a lot of them, so it's, you can compact it. A manageable task yeah, it's manageable. for a weekend? Okay. Another question. Yeah, uh, it's Mike, uh, World Mentoring Academy. I interviewed uh, astronaut Garrett uh, at uh, Caltech this last spring regarding um, what young, young children could get involved in for future colonization of Mars. Of, co of course, we have to get moved from science fiction to the science reality, and that's going to be a little bit of a trick. Um, and he mentioned robotics and hydroponics. Mm -hmm. Another question I had was, uh, well, this is the question. Um, when would you might be opening up for field trips to some of your facilities for, you know, teachers and things of that nature? We do. We do we're, we're a, a private company, um, and it's, it's hard to support a lot of tours. Um, but we do, um, we do do tours for STEM-related uh, uh, schools in the area. So, yeah, you can send me an email, Gwyn at SpaceX.com. <laughs> yeah, I love bringing kids in. They love seeing the dragons getting built and the rocket. It's really great. There you go. And last one, I saw someone with their hand up right here. Yep. What is your relationship? Hold on, wait one second. There's a mic racing to you. There you go. To, uh, Joe Faria, two quick questions. First, why have to land it on a ship in the ocean? Why not just a remote land, uh, land landing of this rocket? And what's your relationship with NASA? Or do you have a relationship with NASA? It was hard to hear you, so just quickly to repeat, why land on the ocean? And what's your relationship with NASA? So if there was an island right along the trajectory, it would be very convenient to land on an island. But you're really, um, you're constrained by physics. Uh, and there isn't an island right where we want it to be. But eventually, we will fire the, the engines and come back to the launch site. Yeah. And our relationship with NASA is extraordinary. SpaceX would not be where we are today without their help and support. Uh, they gave us our first big uh, agreement. I call it a contract, but it wasn't a, specifically a contract. The COTS, Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, was $300 million, uh, $300 million deal to start. Um, and then $1.6 billion to service the International Space Station. And then we were one of the two winners to turn that Dragon spaceship into a crew carrying vehicle at $2.4 billion. So NASA has been a mentor. They've learned from us. We've learned from them. And they've been a great financial supporter as well. Yeah, we love NASA. Gwen Shotwell, absolutely fascinating. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.